Welcome to the first video in Statistics 2 from uh, Edexcel International A-Level course. In this video, we're going to be looking at the binomial distribution and the, the introduction to that. Now, for us to be able to use the binomial distribution, there are a few things that we need to take into consideration, things that have to be present for us to be able to use it within statistics. And the first one is a fixed number of trials. So this has to be fixed. It can't be open-ended. Um, for example, you know, if I was rolling a dice, I'd need to have a set number of times that I rolled that dice. Now, the second thing that we need to have is that there are only two possible outcomes. Something happening or something not happening. For example, could be rolling a six on a dice versus not a six on a dice. Um, it could be within, say, machinery where something creates a fault or not a fault. Where something is damaged or not damaged. So there's only two possible outcomes each time. The third constraint that we have, or the third thing that we need to have present for it to be binomial, is that the trials must be independent of each other. Now, what I mean by that is that if I, the probability of me rolling, say it was a six and not a six, the chances of me getting a six on one dice is independent of whether I roll a six on the, the next dice I roll. So I roll it once and then I pick it back up and then I roll it a second time, that second time has the first dice had no impact on what I get the second time. Okay, if I talked about machinery or talked about something else, sometimes there are things that are conditional, where if something happens the first time, it can affect the probability of it happening again. So that's not you know possible for binomial. It needs to be independent. And the final thing is that the probability must remain constant. So if I go back to the dice one, probability of rolling a six is one sixth. Therefore, the probability of not rolling six is five sixth. That probability remains constant throughout. Okay, if the probability was changing, then I could not use a binomial distribution. So just going back through this again, we've got fixed number of trials. Yeah, only two possible outcomes they're independent and the probability is constant okay so that's what we are kind of making sure all these things need to be present for us to be able to use binomial distribution now if you have your the latest ed excel uh, textbook for s2 or statistics 2 you'll see it on kind of pages two and three there's a great introduction into via an example why um, binomial distribution can be used within probability like this and where the kind of formulas come from why they all used I won't go through that in this video okay I'm just going to focus on actually using it but if you want to have a little bit more understanding and please check out pages two and three. Um, equally, if you do want me to kind of go through that, use that example, maybe and go through it in a video, just put it in the comments and uh, I can do that. You know, if you want to understand a little bit more about where it comes from. Before we get stuck into a few examples, let's also write down now what we're going to be looking at. So. If we think of a random variable binomial and it's going to be n for number of trials and p for probability. So this is how it's going to be set out. Remember, kind of from your normal distribution, we had x is distributed by and then it was n for normal, wasn't it? And so on. So now we've got b for binomial, n for number of trials and p for our probability. So adding that into our sentences above, we get number of fixed trials n, two outcomes, this is success and failure. So it's success or fail, and the probability is obviously p. 
Now, based on our binomial experience from our pure maths last, you know, in year 12, then you would have come up with the formula and the formula is going to be very similar to the one we're using here. So we're looking at when probability where x is equal to r. So you're going to get nr for our ncr. If you remember, you know, ncr would be this kind of button in your calculator. So when you've got that, that will give you that constant there. And then we've got um, prob probability to the power r and 1 minus the probability to the power n minus r. So if you remember, you know, if you've got something in binomial when you had like to the power 5 in total, you'd often have a 5 there. Let's say you had a 5 and a 0, a 4 and a 1, a 3 and a 2 and so on. It's very much the same thing here. Okay, just the difference now is with we've got R for whichever value we're trying to find and N, the total power is going to be the number of trials, so to speak. Sometimes in text, you see N being mentioned as the index and P as the parameter. It's not that important, but just uh, in case you do see it come up in those words. Now we've got that, let's actually look at using it in a couple of examples. So we've got four examples here. And the first one is the probability when x equals 2. So for this one, we've got x equals 2. So that's like when r is 2, yeah? We've got n is 8, as you can see up there. So we've got 8, 2 for our ncr. Our probability is 1 third. That's going to be to the power 2. And then 1 minus 1 third, which is 2 thirds. But I'll put the 1 minus 1 third in there. And that will be then to the remaining power. So it's going to be 6. Okay, n minus r. But just to remember, these two will always add up to this value of n. From here, we just kind of go to our calculators. Now, I'll take an extra step. I wouldn't bother writing this normally. I'm just going to pop it in so that you can double check as you go through this question. And this is going to give me as a fraction 1792 over 6561, which then as a decimal, and we do it to three significant figures, is 0 0.273. And that is, of course, the three significant figures. Part B is very much the same. It's really just here to just emphasize that. So this time we got our N and R is eight and five. One third to the power five, two thirds to the power three. Remembering that these two will always total that. So you can always check whether you're right or not. And that gives me 448 over 6561. I don't need to put the, de the actual fractions in, um, but let's just jump into this. So 0 0.0683 to three significant figures there. Okay, now when we're doing a lot of maths, pretty much all of it, you'll notice on the front of the any exam paper, it generally says three significant figures. So that is what we kind of go to. There are cases where, you know, four significant figures or four decimal places might be more appropriate or less decimal places, less significant figures. But as a general rule, three significant figures is where we like to be. Now, part C is a little bit different. So this is a less than or equal to. Now, in terms of when we move forward and we we look at the next section which is all about cumulative distributions cumulative probabilities um very much like you did with your normal distribution in s1 once we get to that point there'll be other another way of working some of these out but at this point when you've just got the formula there's only one way to work these questions out also this is the way you would work these questions out if they don't um, your value of P and your value of N are not in your uh, 
binomial tables, which we look at in the next video. So for this one, probability that x is less than or equal to 1 is the probability that x is equal to 0 plus the probability that x is equal to 1. So the probability that x equals 0 is quite easy. I'll pop in the full values, but, you know, there's nothing much to it. 8 NCR, you know, that NCR, 8C0 is only going to be 1. Uh, one third to the power zero is also going to be one. So it's just the two thirds to the power eight that we have to do. Okay. And then again, the second one, this one's not too difficult. I put that power of one in there. Obviously, you don't need to put that just to show you, you know, the one and the seven equal eight. So I've worked these out kind of separately here. Just initially, so you can check. So this first one as a fraction is 1024 over 6561. And the first one was 256 over 6561. And that gives me a final answer of 1280 over 6561. Or again, the three significant figures, 0 0.195 there. 3 And then the final one here, x is greater than or equal to 1. That's going to be 1 minus the probability that x equals 0. Because that will then mean that if I take the probability where x equals 0 out, I have 1 and above. So that's going to be 1 minus, and this is essentially going to be 2 thirds to the power 8. I've done the whole bit there, so you know, I'm not worried about that. Or 1 minus 256 over 6561. And I'm going to jump into the decimal places. So 0 0.961 there to three significant figures. And that is a straightforward question. Okay. Um, what you will notice that when you do these kind of questions, or certainly the first parts, these will often make up in terms of exam questions. You may not be given this but you may essentially be given this within a bit of worded context. So here we have a question where we've got a particular genetic marker is present in 4% of the population. State any assumptions that are required to model the number of people with this genetic marker in a sample size n as a binomial distribution. So that's where we've got to kind of think back to our four main points. Fixed number of trials, two outcomes, you know, success, failure. It's independent of, you know, the probability of getting it is independent of the other ones. And that probability is fixed. So those are the assumptions that I would be making. Okay, and it's the same for here. You know, fixed number of trials is what we would need. Only two outcomes. You have the genetic mark or you do not. And that there's a fixed probability of people having the genetic marker. Um, independent, we can also mention here because, you know, if we were doing uh, a sample size, you know, taking a sample, if a genetic marker only appeared within a specific um, kind of race within, within a the population or you know a specific region of the country then you know the probabilities then would nest not necessarily be um independent of each other would they so you know there are things kind of like a practical side of things where you have to think about these things sometimes but in general it's just uh, stating those four bits in the beginning and if possible linking it to the question so here you can see I've written it down. So I'm showing fixed sample size, only two outcomes for the genetic marker, present or not, fixed probability of having the marker, and then I put in that trials are independent. So I'm always going to put those kind of four things in for binomial. For the second part, part B, we can now see that we want to find exactly six people having the marker in a sample size of 50. So we have x is distributed binomial. 
So normal distribution here. Our sample size is 50 and our probability is of 0 0.04, which is our 4%. And we want to find when x equals 6. So we got 50 and 6 for our NCR. 0 0.04 to the power 6. And then we have 0 0.96 to the power 44 and that gives me 0 0.0108 to three significant figures there so you've got you know a little over one percent if you uh, thought of that as a percentage hopefully you've understood the first bit there are a couple of little bits I've left out in terms of like the NCR. I haven't bothered writing this in terms of its factorial. But of course you can use factorial notation for this if you prefer. Um, I think that's it really. So let's uh, give you a few questions to try yourself. Hopefully you found this video useful. Don't forget to like, subscribe and comment down below if you want to see more, if you want to ask questions and so on. And stay tuned for the next one in the series where we look at cumulative probabilities or those probability tables, the binomial tables, very similar to how you work out the normal distributions from the normal tables. So stay tuned.